Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Space Q podcast and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, today, I have Jeff Plate. He is the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development at WGM and the CEO of Interstellar Mining, Inc., a Toronto-based startup. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Mark, and hello to your listeners, and thanks for having me on the show. Great. So today, we're going to talk about uh, space resources. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about the White House Executive Order on Encouraging International Support for the Recovery and Use of Space Resources. Very big, uh, strong policy push uh, by the U.S. government, which has been ongoing for several years. We're going to talk about the Artemis Accords a little bit, and we'll talk a little about, about the reaction in Canada to the uh, recovery and use of space resources. There have been some pushback from parts of the community, the academic community in, in particular. Uh, and so we'll go from, we'll cover those topics. But to start with, um, because of your first time on the show, uh, maybe you could just introduce uh, yourself as to what you do at uh, WGM. And then, uh, you know, since I don't think too many of our listeners are familiar with interstellar mining, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, great, Mark. Well, to, uh, to keep it uh, brief, uh, so WGM is uh, the longest running independent uh, geological and mining consultancy in Canada. We've been in business since 1962. Uh, we operate around the world, so we've done projects in over 130 countries and pretty much every mineable commodity that you could think of, and probably a few you couldn't, uh, which is kind of interesting with us. So, uh, so we got mining in our blood, uh, most definitely, and have had many of our, our founding members are in our partnership have been involved with some of the you know the main mining agencies and, and association groups in the world including the prospectors and developers association of canada pdac the canadian institute of mining cim and a number of others uh, that may not be familiar with your your listeners who uh, are familiar with the mining world in particular so uh so we've got uh, mining in our blood we're geologists we're engineers uh, and we do boots on the ground uh aspects of everything to do from prospecting exploration and the validation of resources is the principal part of our business at wgm where we're the ones that verify uh, i like to steal mark twain's old comment about this we go in and verify that you're not dealing with a hole in the ground with a liar on top so we're the auditors <laughs> in that regard. And so that's actually one of the reasons that we got involved in the space mining uh, community because we've been uh, at it for about 20 years in various different capacities with it, uh, both with private players, governments, the UN, uh, and others. So we were involved with it. Uh, and so on that side of it, we've been involved in a lot of the regulatory aspects around how do you uh, administer uh, the international rules that we have in capital markets, to give certainty to people who are putting money to work on mining projects, whether on terrestrial or off world to do it. And of course, the, the way that you do things on terrestrial mining is not the same as outer space. The moon or outer space is not earth. Anyway, as a result of all of this, I got involved in doing a lunar water economic study that we published uh, last August, uh, where we were taking the same methodology we would have used with any terrestrial mining project and determining the economic viability of it. And so I did that for lunar water, and our conclusions were uh, pretty spectacular in that there's an existing market today. Um, we figured out the, that the lunar water, for example, is worth $10 million US a ton, and that you can profitably mine it for uh, probably around $500,000 a ton using existing technology. So we don't need to develop anything new uh, to do this. We just have to put it together, assemble it, and get it onto the moon. And so as a result of that, we got together with myself, uh, Dale Boucher, I, I know that you're probably very familiar with from Delta and Innovations, yeah. and uh, uh, followed by the name of Paolo, Red, or Paolo Lestrito, who is the president of Red Cloud Securities, which is a Toronto-based uh, boutique investment dealer who deals only in mining. And Paolo's a mining engineer by background as well. So the three of us got together and launched Interstellar Mining because we realized that there's a tremendous commercial opportunity here, for, especially for the first player, that can get out on the moon and actually do it and actually mine stuff. So that's why we formed Interstellar Mining as a startup. And we're in the process right now of taking and flushing out all of our business development plans and going through our initial capital raises. And we're talking to some, some fairly deep pocketed investors right now to make the investable in, uh, initial investments that will allow us to complete feasibility studies and then to launch our first mission um, which is satellite-based uh, reconnaissance exploration on the moon 
uh, probably 2022 at this stage. You might be a little delayed because of COVID. So here we go. <laughs> well, now you see, you've brought up a whole slew of questions that, that just popped into my head. So uh, I'll sure. just have to, just a couple of them to, 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 to start with. Um, and, and we'll get to the stuff that we're really supposed to be talking about. But uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, so in terms of getting your business plan put together and in terms of your first raise, what are you looking at in terms of funding, in terms of, uh, of what you're after? Well, I can share with you a couple of things right now. Sure. Um, so right now we're, we're doing our initial raise and it's only five million US dollars is that we're looking to get. And that'll allow us to basically complete for what a terrestrial mining project would have would be a feasibility study. There's a lot of devil in the engineering details and a lot of moving parts across a lot of different skill sets and boundaries. And no one's ever done this before, so we're wanting to make sure we've got all that lined up so we can have confidence for our investors in what we're doing. Um, so that, that's the first stage. And then uh, our capital development plans are such that we only need to raise about 165 million US dollars to actually launch all three of our missions and have an operating water mine on the moon. And we're looking to try to get that done by about 2025. Well, that sounds exciting. We're going to have to talk about that on a separate. Show. Yeah, we're going to have a separate call because that's a deep rabbit hole with a lot of detail. So. And, and, and it's very interesting uh, to my listeners. Okay. But so before we actually get mining anywhere in space mm -hmm. or an asteroid or the moon, we got to deal a little bit with the politics and space policy. And, um, uh, we know that in the U.S. there's been a push for several years um, to uh, get space resource uh, access going. Uh, there's many companies that are trying to get into this. Some have folded, didn't make it. They were too early. Um, deep space industries being one of those, planetary resources being another one of those. Uh, but there are several others that are still trying, including Moon Express, uh, which they helped push the legislation uh, agenda in the US uh, and actually are co-owned by uh, Bob Richards, uh, an expat. So uh, to that end, uh, the White House, who are very strongly in favor of this, put out in, in April this executive order, uh, you know, encouraging international support for the recovery and, uses, uh, recovery and use of space resources. I'm gonna take it based on what you're trying to do that you're 100% in favor of this executive order and what, they, what they're trying to accomplish? Well, uh, Mark, it's actually, it's, I'm gonna answer that both with a yes and a no. So first and foremost, interstellar mining itself is actually 100% Canadian owned uh, and operated. We're domiciled here in Toronto. Um, although that's the current state of affairs and we remain flexible in terms of who we may, where we may re-domicile anyway based on uh, what makes most sense from a commercial perspective with it. Uh, one of the things driving the discussion around this is the legal uh, uncertainties around the ownership of resources once you, in effect, get it in your spaceship uh, with it. Uh, and so the Outer Space Treaty, you know, when it was written back in the late 60s, you know, space is a domain of, of major superpowers and space powers. And so they didn't envision commercial players, you know, going up and doing this. So. The one thing that the legislation or the executive order in the U.S. and their legislation as well as the uh, mirror legislation in Luxembourg does is provides legal certainty around that. And anytime you can remove any uncertainties that you have within your business plan, that's an obvious positive. You know, at, at Interstellar Mining, we believe, you know, two things fundamentally. One, uh, the best solution for the regulation of space, which will occur in due course, is through a multinational negotiated treaty amongst all the space powers uh, because they, they're the ones really with the skin in the game uh, with this. Um, but we also recognize the realities of that and that because of, uh, you know, geopolitics, uh, terrestrial politics and the rest, that that could be an endeavor that could take decades. And in the interim, uh, we're going down the track of, of looking to develop the system of our economy. Um, so there needs to be some support from individual nation states to give that legal certainty to the players involved. So the US and Luxembourg have recognized that I understand a number of other countries, for example, Australia, the UK, UAE, for example, are following a similar track of national legislation that, rec that acknowledges these commercial rights in space, 
so that they don't end up in a competitive disadvantage. And one of the things that uh, we, we've been doing both at WGM and Interstellar Mining is communicating with the federal government here in Canada, that it would be in our national interest to mirror some of this legislation um, and as a stopgap measure uh, until such time as we can negotiate uh, a framework that is multilateral, so. And I don't think we're gonna see any multilateral agreement in the near future. Uh, definitely bilateral agreements, uh, but uh, getting Russia and China on board uh, to agree to what the US wants to do at this point, uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know if I can foresee that happening uh, in the near future. And I would echo that sentiment, but you know, we better try, because ultimately what the goal of an outer, of a, call it Outer Space Treaty 2 will be, is basically the rules of the road to manage these sorts of things. And we've, we've got large international treaties that have been done in the middle of the Cold War, you know, on, on aeronautics and flight, navigation of the sea and things like that. So I suspect we can come to some accommodation along the commercial interests, the geopolitical elements and the uh, geopolitics of space. That's a whole different ball game with it. But I think if we can get some, some general agreement on some large scale principles that probably line up with the Outer Space Treaty, you know, will we'll help to sort of forego some of the potential for the first space war. Um, and like all wars, the first one will be fought over resources <laughs> and land, territory. That's what all wars are fought over. Yeah, so this brings us, uh, brings me to the Artemis Accords. Yes. Um, this is uh, uh, NASA working with the State Department uh, and I'm pushed uh, by the White House um, to get uh, nation states that are interested in participating in NASA's Artemis program to agree to some basic principles uh, and to have nation states, uh, you know, form bilateral agreements with the U.S., uh, you know, where they basically are going to agree to these principles. And for the most part, the principles are actually quite good. They, they yeah. follow the Outer Space Treaty, um, but there are a couple of things in there that, that, that do uh, bring up some uh, issues. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in an international perspective on this, uh, from the policy side, um, I did interview uh, David Kendall uh, recently on that, and that uh, uh, video is available on YouTube, and the audio will be posted to our podcast channel uh, uh, very shortly. But um, from your perspective, what, what is it uh, in the artist? First of all, how do you view the Artemis Accords yourself? Okay. Well, I mean, uh, we actually had a board meeting on this uh, more generally, but, well, we had a board meeting about two weeks ago for Interstellar Mining where we actually discussed a, a number of facets that uh, affected or, or dealt with the Artemis Accords. So first and foremost, Interstellar Mining believes fundamentally in the principles of the Outer Space Treaty, and we are committed as a company you know, acting as a responsible global citizen. Uh, we believe fundamentally in the non-interference with others and wherever possible to uh, reduce or eliminate any negative externalities from our, our business. And then that is first and foremost how we're doing. Um, you know, outer space is a bit of an unusual situation. And one of the things as an observation I'll just share with your listeners that I've found in my journey in this is, you know, we are all terrestrially bound and so we tend to all view uh, everything in outer space through an Earth-based mindset, which generally doesn't apply in space. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, and a lot of your listeners may be as well, so, uh, which provides some biases. And some of that creeps in a little bit with some of the Artemis Accords. But the Accords themselves, you know, are generally fully acceptable in, in almost their entirety uh, with what a commercial operator would want to see, because they provide some certainty in terms of, uh, the, in effect, the rules of the road of how you could operate collectively. I will say that, that those accords were written, though, by a public agency whose mission is not dedicated is dedicated to science and the advancement of the knowledge and exploration of space on behalf of the U.S. people. So it's it's NASA who's the authors, um, and consequently they have certain drivers around them that don't necessarily apply to a commercial operator. So their NASA's mission is science. Interstellar Mining's mission is profit. We're a for-profit commercial enterprise. So things like, you know, uh, transparency uh, in principle, I like, but uh, for commercial reasons, I need to have commercial confidentiality. And so for example, some of my exploration work, 
you know, identifying, because I spent all of that money and effort, identifying the best place to prospect and put my water mine. Um, and why would I give that away for free to everybody? Uh, another example of that is uh, this idea of uh, science first. Um, I'm a scientist myself, I'm a geophysicist. So the thing is, is that I understand and appreciate, you know, the importance of science to the community, but there's a cost associated with it. Public agency can do that. I can't as a, as a uh, commercial enterprise, simply because, you know, uh, I have shareholders that I gotta be accountable to uh, and my board with what we're doing. And ultimately we gotta make a profit on this. Um, so, but having said that, we are cognizant as a company of our corporate social responsibility as a corporate citizen, a galactic citizen, to wherever possible help uh, humankind in terms of, of this information. Because a lot of the work that we're doing is going to be firsts. And so we're cognizant of the historic nature of what we're doing. And so we want to balance that with what we're doing. So one of the things the Artemis Accord has, for example, is you know a openness in terms of science first and sharing all that information where available. Well, I can't exactly do that as a commercial player. So I would alter that to say, you know, we're in your public agency that that's uh, aspirational. And definitely over the course of time, I wouldn't want to sit on scientific information that would be valuable to the wider world, um, you know, unless I have good commercial reasons for doing so to maintain my competitive advantage. You know, but I could see over in, in time, you know, the, the releasing of, of information once we're done with it for scientific reasons and study. And then, um, you know, both WGM and Interstellar Mining contains relationships with a number of different global universities who have space programs uh, that focus on the work that we're doing, both from a mining, geological engineering, aerospace, uh, civil construction, all of these sorts of things, uh, where we have relationships with them and would seek, you know, uh, public-private partnerships to gather that information and have that information disseminated through the academic community. Uh, it's something we're not opposed to. In fact, we built some of that into our business plans, so. Now, um, I'll, I would point out that the Artis, Artemis Accords are actually only if you're participating in the Artemis program uh, and that um, Canada, if it's going to participate, which they intend to, you know, we'll negotiate uh, a bilateral agreement with the U.S. But I, I, I would think that uh, as a commercial player, you don't necessarily have to abide by the accords if you're not actually participating in the Artemis program itself. Uh, that gets a little tricky, Mark, because, you know, as a commercial operator, you know, I, I have an understanding that, you know, I'm willing to do business with anybody. I mean, it is our hope and desire to have the first, in effect, gas station in space <laughs> on the South Pole of the Moon uh, with it. So it, because of that, I am open for business for anybody and anybody to come along as long as you're a paying client to, uh, to purchase our products and services. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I recognize the geopolitical implications of, you know, doing business with the Russians or the Chinese because... Primarily, my clients likely are going to be North American, European, and Asian, <laughs> uh, who are part of sort of the Western Alliance group. And there's both military and civilian clientele from NASA itself, the Defense Department, uh, and any of those players uh, with it. Uh, so the thing is, is that, you know, I've got to be cognizant as a commercial operator of basically playing ball by their rules because they might have that as a condition of doing business. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, we're probably 90, 95% there and, and being agreeable and amenable to those, those conditions of the Artemis program. So, but, uh, you know, Interstellar Mining is an eclipse provider, so we don't have to live by those rules uh, necessarily. And if we got the only gas station too, we can potentially even write some of the rules. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm curious, you know, one of the uh, Artemis, Artemis Accords, that, uh, one of the principles that stand out to me is the deconfliction uh, of activities mm -hmm. and um, this n not very well defined safety zones. Um, you know, both the US, China and others are very interested in the lunar South Pole. And um, we don't know who's gonna get there first, whether it's the US, whether it's China, commercial, probably not, but maybe commercial with 
uh, the U.S. Uh, civil program, uh, or well, obviously with the U.S. civil program. But um, but you know, you land. Let's say it's a it's a U.S. entity under a contract, uh, the CLIPS contract with with uh, with NASA, right? One of the landings that are supposed to go there next year. Um, and so now you declare a safety zone around that area. Well, how big is that safety zone? Um, what if uh, somebody who hasn't signed on to the Artemis Accords says, you know, it doesn't make a difference. We're interested in that same area as well. We're going to keep a distance from you. We're going to make sure it's safe. But, you know, you had said, let's say, a 10-kilometer exclusion zone. But you know what? It, it's, it's, we need to land at about 8 kilometers from you. We're going to do it anyway. Are we going to have any issues with that, or, or is this just me making noise? Okay, well, I could probably, there's probably about three main points that I think I'd like to address on this one. So the first and foremost, you know, I'm going to address this as a mining company, okay? So here on Earth, we have mining claims, and you have a, um, you know, a sovereign authority that I was monitoring that. You got no such beast in, in outer space um, because of the Outer Space Treaty, and this is something that be negotiated of sort of how do you administer this with a cadastro system, and you know, and administering that so you have to realize the economic value. Uh, that's something I wrestled with a lot about a year and a half ago in designing, um, you know, uh, the, the economic analysis of this. But one of the things that's most important to understand is that, you know, uh, as a mining operation, I can tell you that the footprint that I have, my pit size of, of excavated material I need to make is tiny. It's 35 meters by 35 meters by two meters deep annually. That is a very, very small, sort of area that I need to mine. And if water resources are as ubiquitous as we believe they may be on the moon, there's no reason to fight over one little patch of ground. You can literally land beside me and dig a pit yourself, and we can both happily run our businesses. Which leads me to the second point, if I could segue in, is in, the big issue is going to be in orbital traffic coming up and down from the surface. You know, if you're landing on raw little regolith, the ejecta that is coming off the back of spacecraft coming up and down can fire cobble and, and gravel size uh, chunks of stone at distance and at speed that can very easily damage equipment. Not to mention the fact that smaller grain size material at the clay and fine sand and silt level, you know, some of it actually will orbit the moon and send or sort of blast you from the other side. And that's just part of the operating environment. There's not much you can do about the fine stuff, but the other stuff you can deal with is there's a couple of mitigation strategies. The big one, and this is what we're planning to do with Interstellar, is to build a landing pad uh, with it that'll have a berm uh, about two meters high on either side of it that'll allow orbital traffic so that you can come up and down that won't fire ejecta everywhere um, because it's in and both of our interests for the protection of our operations um, to ensure that we don't and aren't firing stuff up into the atmosphere or a distance because you're in low gravity. Uh, can travel quite far. Um, so it's important to have that safety structure there. So uh, the last point is sort of around, well, what happens when you wanted to land in the same spot? And I don't have an easy answer for that. I think it's likely going to be uh, a situation where it's going to be whoever gets there first basically claims the turf. Um, you know, possessions nine tenths of the law in some respect. Um, I like to, uh, when I I address these legality questions. I like to draw on a analogy from Earth here that is in the terrestrial U.S. Actually, um, have you ever heard of a town called Deadwood? I think I heard of a movie or a yeah. TV show called Deadwood. Yeah, well, Deadwood is a place. It's located in South Dakota in a place called the Black Hills. The Black Hills on the Dakota uh, were back in 1876. Were actually ceded to the Sioux Nation by the U.S. from the Treaty of Fort Laramie after the Battle of the Little Bighorn where General Custer got killed. Um, that probably rings some bells. Anyway, that was the site of the largest single gold strike in world history uh, that, at that time. And the area, because it was uh, considered Indian territory back then, um, basically wasn't operating under a Western legal system and it was considered a legal no man's land. Sounds very similar to the moon. Anyway, you had a 10 year period where uh, mining companies went in there uh, and individual prospectors and miners and pulled out a modern equivalent of tens of billions of dollars worth of gold all in a lawless environment um, without any law at all. 
And so there's a great HBO series that uh, called Deadwood about it that's historically accurate uh, that talks about this sort of thing. And so you may have a similar situation here where if you land and are working that patch, you're fine, but uh, unless you get uh, protection from you know, some space force, like the US Space Command, for example, um, there's not much you can do except land on top of them. And if you do that, you're gonna damage somebody's equipment by existing treaties. Whoever flag you fly, that country's legally responsible for the damages you do. And then they're gonna come back to you to collect. So, um, you know, but the thing is, is that the moon's big. It's sparsely populated, even with all of these players going in. So I suspect the amount of fighting over stuff is going to be non-existent initially. Um, but, uh, you know, conflicts will occur in time. But it's going to take a lot more development. Well, I think uh, what we can take from this is that uh, um, we're at a stage now where these things are going to happen. Uh, I don't mean the negative things, but that uh, we are going to go back to the moon. Uh, there will be prospectors going to the moon, including potentially your company. Mm -hmm. And uh, resources are, are going to be used. And, uh, well, you know, if you're in the space business and you're interested in the commercial side of it, it's a very exciting time. It is, and, um, you know, the returns, if you pardon the expression, are astronomical. That's why we formed the company. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're going to leave it on that note, unless you had another point to make that, that I've missed. No, I think we've covered this off pretty, pretty broadly. And uh, perhaps another time we can discuss mining more generally on the moon and some of the uh, issues associated with it. Oh, I can guarantee you that, though. We'll, we'll do that. All right. So that'll be it for today. Thank you for being my guest. Okay. Thank you for having me, Mark. <laughs>